Hey guys, how's it going? In this video we're going to look at the evolution of stars, so let's get started. Before we look at the typical life cycle of stars, we're going to look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This is a really important diagram which you need to be able to interpret. So it says here that the characteristics, lifetime and ultimate fate of a particular star depends solely on its mass, which in turn is constrained by the quantity of material available during the star's formation. A Hertzsprung-Russell diagram or an HR diagram relates a star's luminosity to its temperature. Stars are plotted on the diagram according to their size and luminosity and they are found to fall into groups, namely the main sequence, giants, supergiants and white dwarfs. So if you look at this picture you'll see we have the luminosity on the y-axis and that's measured in solar units so it's comparing it to the luminosity of the sun. So 10 to the 0 would be the value of 1 and that would be 1 solar unit. And then on the x-axis we have the temperature scale in Kelvin. But notice that the scale doesn't look like a normal kind of scale, it's actually reversed and it's logarithmic as well, which we'll point out later. So the majority of stars will typically fall into one of these four regions. And it depends on the mass of that star and the properties of that star as to where it's going to end up on the diagram. Now it's worth pointing out that the giants and supergiants are also known as red giants and red supergiants. And you'll notice a sort of distinct pattern here on the HR diagram where for the main sequence we've got this kind of thin diagonal strip which then curves off towards the lower region here. And then we've got this cluster of stars in the upper right region called the giant region. And then we've got another cluster with fewer stars in it in the supergiant region above the main sequence there. And then below the main sequence towards the lower middle, the lower left, we've got the white dwarf region. And remember we said that the majority of stars in the universe are going to be of a lower mass. So that's why the main sequence there has a lot more stars than say the giant, supergiant and white dwarf regions. And the last thing I want to point out here is the colour of the stars. So notice that at the top left region of the main sequence we have our hottest stars because they are blue and then the cooler the star is the further down the main sequence it will be. So we have our sort of greens there, our yellows there and then oranges and reds. And remember red is the coolest type of star. And in this picture, because we know our sun is roughly yellowy or orangey, then we could say it's going to be around here on the main sequence. Just to give you some examples of stars that exist on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, we can look at this diagram here. So on the main sequence, we've got Sirius A here, which is actually a hotter star than the sun. We've then got the sun, which is a bit further down. And then down towards the cooler stars here on the main sequence, we've got Proxima Centauri, which is actually the next nearest star to the sun. Over in the giant region, we have Betelgeuse. And then getting hotter, we have Polaris in the supergiant region. And going below the main sequence to the white dwarfs, we have white dwarfs such as Sirius B. Going back to the notes now, it says here that as a sun-like star goes through the various stages of its life cycle, it follows a certain path on the diagram. And you can hopefully see that all stars will exist to begin with on the main sequence. And then once they've been on the main sequence, they can become a red giant or a red supergiant. And then they're going to follow the path to becoming a white dwarf. So it says here that a sun-like star will spend most of its life in the main sequence. When it runs out of hydrogen, it will move to the giants. Once helium fusion is complete, the red giant ejects its outer layers to become a very hot and small white dwarf. Eventually, the white dwarf cools down and fades away. And the last point to note is what we said earlier, that both axes on the diagrams are logarithmic and the x-axis is reversed, so that the hottest stars are at the left-hand side of the diagram. So if we look back at this diagram, we've got the hottest stars over here and the coolest stars over here and it's the same in this one as well. So hottest stars over here, coolest stars over here. We're now going to look at the stages involved in the evolution of a star, which begins with the main sequence stars. So it says here that once a star is formed and established hydrogen fusion, it will occupy a position somewhere along the main sequence, which is a band of stars lying from the upper left to the lower right of the HR diagram, which we just saw. The position within the main sequence is determined by the mass of the star, with the most massive at the upper left and the least massive at the lower right. So if we look back at the diagram, we've got the most massive stars over here and the least massive towards the lower right. It then says that those at the upper left of the diagram have lifetimes of the order of several million years, whilst the smallest, coolest stars have lifetimes in excess of 300 billion years. For example, our own sun was formed around 4.5 billion years ago and will have a main sequence lifetime of 10 billion years, so it is roughly halfway through its main sequence phase. So stars begin their journey on the main sequence where they undergo nuclear fusion where hydrogen is converted into helium. Next we have the red giants and it says that when the hydrogen in the core runs out, nuclear fusion stops and the outward thermal pressure decreases. The helium core contracts and heats up under the weight of the star since the gravitational force inwards is now greater. 
The outer layers expand and cool and the star becomes a red giant. It then says there is still enough hydrogen in the outer core and the temperature high enough for hydrogen fusion to take place. So in the outer core we still get hydrogen being converted into helium. The helium core continues to contract until it eventually becomes hot and dense enough for helium to fuse into carbon and oxygen, the heavier elements. This releases a large amount of energy pushing the outer layers of the star further outwards. So there's our dense core there where helium is being converted into elements like carbon and oxygen and on the outer core we have our hydrogen being converted into helium. Moving on, the next stage is white dwarf. So it says that as a red giant continues to expand, it eventually reaches a size where the outer layers of the star can no longer be retained by gravitational attraction and the star enters the final phase of its lifetime. In terms of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the star moves left and downwards out of the giant region. So if we look back at our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, you see that when we go from red giant to white dwarf, it moves along here towards the lower left. And it then says that the outer layers steadily disperse as a planetary nebula, leaving behind the stellar core. Since fusion no longer occurs in this dead core, it steadily cools, moving down the HR diagram until it becomes an inert white dwarf. So at this point we say that the star is essentially dead and it will just continue to cool down over time. What we've just discussed however, is what happens to low mass stars, i.e. stars that are similar to the mass of the sun. But what happens if our stars are high mass stars, much greater than the mass of the sun? Well, we're going to start looking at supergiants here. And it says that the evolution of a high mass star is similar to that of a low mass star in the early stages when hydrogen is fused to form helium. However, as the hydrogen runs out and helium fusion begins, the process of expansion is much greater than for a low mass star and the star becomes a supergiant. For example, the red supergiant Antares is shown below, which is this thing here. Instead of becoming a white dwarf, our high mass stars are going to follow a different eventual fate. So they're either going to become a neutron star or a black hole. And this leads us into neutron stars, black holes and supernovae. So it says here that once a high mass star has become a supergiant, its core will eventually collapse in on itself very rapidly, releasing enormous amounts of energy. This energy release blows away the outer layers of the star into space and emits a massive burst of radiation known as a supernova. For example, the Crab supernova is shown below. So here's the Crab supernova and says, fun fact, for a brief moment, a supernova can outshine an entire galaxy. And lastly, it says after a supernova, stars of very high mass will eventually form a black hole whereas stars with only a high mass will form a neutron star. So here's a picture of a black hole, which was the first properly detected image. And then we've also got a picture of a neutron star. So just to summarize how a star is actually formed and becomes a main sequence star, well, we're gonna look at this animation. So we start off with the molecular cloud and then gravity overcomes thermal pressure, causing it to contract. And eventually the two forces become balanced. So the thermal pressure outwards balances the gravitational force inwards. And it says here that the energy released escapes as infrared, i.e. heat radiation. And then what happens, this increase in density reduces the escape of infrared and temperature builds up. The temperature is not yet high enough for nuclear fusion to occur and we end up with something called a protostar. So this protostar will then continue to contract until the temperature and pressure build up more and more until eventually it's hot enough for hydrogen fusion to occur. And now hydrogen fusion can occur when the star is hot enough and we say that the star contracts a little more until it is in gravitational equilibrium and it's now a main sequence star. And just to help you visualize the eventual fate of low mass, high mass and very high mass stars, we're going to look at these wee animations here. So first of all, for low mass stars, this is what happens. So we have our core reducing and then forming a red supergiant or a red giant. So we have our collapsed core and eventually these layers drift off and it leaves behind a white dwarf. However, for high mass stars, a similar thing happens to begin with. So our core will shrink and then eventually we end up with a neutron star. And then what happens is we get a supernova produced from that. And lastly, for the very high mass stars, it's very similar. So we've got our extremely dense collapsed core here and the collapse of the core continues to form a supernova. And then eventually a black hole forms. So going back to the notes to summarize this then, all stars will start off in the same way. So we have that a star forms from a cloud of gas and then becomes a main sequence star, where it either then becomes a red giant or a supergiant, 
and then if it's a low mass star, it's similar to the mass of our sun, then it eventually forms a white dwarf which eventually cools and fades away, so that's essentially dying. But if it's a high mass star greater than the mass of our sun, then a supernova is formed, and what is left if it's a high mass star is a neutron star, but if we've got a very high mass star, then it becomes a black hole. And from this, it is clear that every star ultimately becomes either a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. So we can say that the mass of the star determines its eventual fate, despite all stars starting off as main sequence stars. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching, if you made it to the end I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.